So if you would, turn with me in your Bible to 1 Samuel chapter uh, 17. You know, I found in the first service that as I read the story, um, I read parts of it, I'm going to read parts of it here too, that it almost began to, uh, to like push people away, like they were wanting to hear the story because sometimes when you, when you read a story that you love, if you've ever gone to Bible school or if you've ever been in church for even just a little while, you've read the story of David and Goliath. How many people have heard that story? Like a lot of people have heard that story if you've been around church at all. And uh, there's a lot of pieces inside of that story, though, that are very, very powerful, that are very unique, that a lot of times this is where we start with. We're like, David's a young kid. He comes up, challenges Goliath, gets five you know, rocks or whatever, throws it, hits Goliath in the head, the giant falls down, David wins. The army of Israel goes for it. I mean, that's kind of like our, that's our story. Because a lot of times the ones that we know the best are the ones that we honestly don't know the best. We just like them the most. You know what I mean? Like you, you recognize it and you're aware of it, but honestly, the implications of the story, there's a, ton, <laughs> there's a ton of it there. And honestly, I'm probably gonna miss some of it. Uh, but there's a lot of different implications. And so the message this morning is all about my focus or our focus on 2017. Like, how are we going to perceive things? How are we going to look at the obstacles? Just as David saw Goliath, how are we going to see the obstacles and the things that we're facing? Um, how are we going to view those things? How are we going to approach those things? How are we going to go in the strength of the Lord to deal with those things? So I'm encouraging you as you listen to some of this is to take in, take heart, Take notes, uh, mark in your Bible. It's a great thing, I believe, to do so you can find things that you have put in here. So the story starts out in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 1, and it says that the Philistines and the Israelites had gathered at the valley of Elah and that they were getting prepared to fight each other. And one was on one cliff and one was on the other cliff, and then there was a valley in between them. And so basically they would get up together and they would draw army lines and all that kind of good stuff, and they would chant their war chants. And the Philistines were a headache to the Israelites. Until David really did a number to him when he became, he finally became king, the Philistines were always a problem for the people of Israel. They were always trying to defeat them. They were always trying to pillage their stuff, steal what they had, take which they had worked for. And so they had gathered together and they were getting ready to fight each other. And then all of a sudden, this giant of a man named Goliath, everybody heard of Goliath? Uh, Goliath was a massive dude. He was not Shaquille O'Neal. He was Shaquille O'Neal plus two feet, five inches. Nine foot, six inches. It says he was six cubits. How many of y'all know what a cubit is that does metric systems? I, I don't know what a cubit means. But a cubit is like 18 inches and a span is six inches. And it says that he was literally nine feet, six inches. And it says that he had a coat of bronze upon him and a helmet of bronze upon him. And the coat of bronze, which is what protected him, right? It said that it was... 5,000 shekels. How many of y'all know how much a shekel weighs? See, that's when you read the Bible and some of y'all are just like, I'm skipping that. I don't even know what that means. But I mean, you're just like, he's a big dude, so it's got to be a big coat. And some of y'all are thinking like a fur coat. It's not a fur coat. It's a metal coat, right? He's over here. He has this huge body and a huge coat. And it says it's 5,000 shekels. How much is that? That's 125 pounds worth of weight just in the armament on his chest. Okay. Y'all understand what I'm getting at? Uh, This was a massive, massive guy. It says he has it on his legs, uh, armament and brass. It says that his uh, spear is the size of a weaver's beam, which means it's more than likely very thick, very large, and probably about 20 feet long. I mean, so we're talking about something huge. The tip of the spear weighed, I believe it was like 600 shekels, which again means nothing until you compute it. 15 pounds was the tip of his spear. And so can you imagine this massive dude who probably weighs between minimally 400, 500 pounds if he's nine foot six. And yes, I have not seen a nine foot six person, but in the Bible, it talks about Nephilim. It talks about people that we haven't seen necessarily before in our day and time. Yes, there's very tall people out there. Okay, so we're on the same page. He was a big dude. So you could imagine that no matter what kind of shield you threw up, if he threw that spear, it was probably going to knock you down or at least go through it. This giant came out before them. This is where I want to pick up reading in your Bible with you a little bit. It said that he came up and said in verse 8, he stood and he shouted at the ranks of Israel. And I don't know about y'all, but if y'all have seen big guys before, again, seven foot and over, they typically have growth hormone like elevation, which is why they get so tall. I bet his voice was super deep, you know. Like my, not my, like my voice. No, I'm just kidding. It's not like my voice at all. <laughs> he, he probably had a deep voice. I, I always do a deep voice when I get around guys. Like, yeah, how are you doing? You know, I just, he had a deep voice, but it was really scary. Not like mine. He stood and he shouted to the ranks of Israel and he said, why have you come to draw up your battle? Am I not a Philistine? Or are you not servants of Saul? He's already putting them down. He's like, you're already slaves of Saul. 
Am I not a Philistine? He says, choose a man for yourself and let him come down to me. If, if he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we'll be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you will be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And it says, when Saul, now I know y'all have read y'all's Bible, right? Saul, when he was chosen king, it says was head and shoulders above every single other Israelite. So Saul was fairly tall for an Israelite, but it says this about Saul and the rest of the army. It says that all of Saul and all of Israel heard the words of the Philistine and they were dismayed and greatly afraid. They were paralyzed by fear because of this giant. They were just like, there's, there's no way. I mean, what he's saying is if one of us goes and fights him, that if he kills us, then our entire army is going to be, and honestly, you know how other negative armies would be. Like if he lost, they weren't about to surrender like that. I mean, but Israel being a little bit of a different nation, if they gave their word, then they gave their word. And so you're imagining here, these people are scared to death. We can't do this. So enter in David into the picture. He's out there tending the flock of his father's sheep. His father says, hey, I want you to go check on your older three brothers who are fighting in the war and give me word about how they're doing. So he sends David up there to where the battle's at. See, a lot of people think when you read the story that David was already out there prepared for war. Like he was just, he was the only one who was going to stand up. David came out there. He was not expecting to fight Goliath. He was not expecting to fight at all. He was expecting just to get word from his brothers, give some food to them, and then go back to his father and tend the sheep. You see, there's going to be things that come up in your life that you are not prepared for, that no one gave you a forewarning about that you have to have already been prepared for before you ever get there. You've already got to be prepared for it before you ever get there, or you're not going to be prepared at all. So he gets there, and it says that the giant Goliath came out as he normally did, and it says he began to shout, and it says that David heard him. There's a big difference here. David heard him for the first time, and it says he had been doing this for 40 days. In the morning, he'd come out and shout at him, and at the evening, he'd come out and shout at him. And it says that he came out as he normally did, and this was after the 40th day, and David heard him, and he said to the people, he said, what are we going to do about this, this pagan over here? Like, why hadn't somebody killed him? I mean, let's, let's do something about this guy. David's about 15 to 20 years old, roughly. Who knows where he's at right about that time, but say he's about 20 years old. He's a smaller kind of guy for the most part, as far as we can gather. Not super short, but just smaller. And he's like, let's do something about this guy. And the people said, listen, if someone kills this man, Saul is not only going to give you his daughter in marriage, so the right hand to the throne. I mean, you're going to be brought into the royal family. He's going to also exempt his father's house from taxes, He's also going to pay him a lot of money. And David's over here like, why are y'all not going after this enemy? Like, why are y'all not stepping up and, and fighting him? So he asked another person. He asked another person, his older brother, Eliab. He says, get out of here, man. All you're doing is trying to cause trouble. You just want to see the fight. That's all you're doing here. You're just ratting around. Why don't you go tend to those few sheep that you have? He's pushing him away. He's basically making fun of him, saying, listen, you, you don't have any responsibility. You're a nobody. Just get out of here. And finally, word gets back to Saul that David, y'all remember in the story now? Finally, the word gets back to Saul that there's this kid over here saying he wants to fight Goliath. And so Saul brings David into his tent where he's at and begins to talk to him. And David says, listen, I've killed a lion and I've killed some bear. I mean, I, I've, been, I've been prepared for this. I, I'll fight him. He's not a problem. He's defying the Lord. You know, we'll, we'll get this guy. And Saul's like, listen, man, you're just a youth. This dude's been a man of war since he was a youth. Like, you don't understand who you're about to go up against. Now, listen to this. Saul, I know I'm not reading all these verses, so I want you to. Verse 38. So Saul finally concedes to allow him to come in. Verse 38 says, Then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put on a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword on over his armor, and he tried in vain to go for he had not tested them. So he puts on because Saul had a preconceived notion of what a fighter should look like. Listen, there's a lot of things that are going to happen in 2017 where people are going to have preconceived molds as to how you should live, how you should look, how you should act, how you should do things. Listen, God has created you and there's only one of you and you're to live out the calling that God has placed on your life. You're not supposed to put in everything that everyone else tells you you're supposed to be because honestly, there are so many people who live out there and just saying, well, I'm being pulled this way and I'm being pulled this way and I'm being pulled this way because they say I should do this and they say I should do this. Who has God called you to be? Who's God called you to be? David said, I haven't tested this stuff. I can't wear this stuff. Saul, it was made for you. And are you trying to be someone else, to be very honest with you? 
That's really a great question to ask. Are you trying to live someone else's life? Is someone trying to live vicariously through you? You know, is someone trying to push you in a direction that honestly you're not equipped for? That's not what you were called to do and that God has a different plan for you because when you're walking in his plan and in his calling, it changes everything about it. So what does David do? David takes off all the clothes, goes out there in the same clothes that he came up with, which is just basic normal clothing, goes out there, picks up five smooth stones from the river bank, goes ahead to the battle line, and this is what uh, Goliath says to him. Verse 41, it says, The Philistine moved forward and came to, near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. So it wasn't just Goliath, it was a shield bearer as well. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he dis, disdained him, for he was a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. Okay, can you imagine this dude? Looking up and down at this guy like, you're kidding me. Like, is, basically, he's like, is this an insult? You, you're going to send me, like, this little bitty runt of the litter to come and fight me to represent you? I mean, this is who you're going to send to me? It said he disdained him, and he began to say this to him in verse 43. Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? Why do you say that? He had a shepherd's staff in his hand as well. He's walking up there with a stick in his hand. And a slingshot, and I'm not talking about the one you pull back. I'm talking about the one that you grab the rock, you put it in, and you start slinging around, and then you let it go. Like, this is what he was coming to fight, a man who had a massive sword, who had a massive spear, who was covered from head to toe with armament, who was nine foot six inches tall, and he was a huge dude, okay? This is who he was coming to fight. This is David and Goliath. This is not a made-up story. So this is what David says to him. He says, then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with sword and with spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. Amen. The Lord of the armies, or the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and I will cut off your head. You hear, he's speaking into the future about what he's about to do to Goliath. Now listen to me. I understand how we're about to use this. We're going to turn it into you have problems, you have obstacles, you have things in your life. And God has not created you to turn tail and run backwards. God's created you to confront the enemy. God's con told you to confront fear and to confront deception and confront those things which are calling you down in your own life. He says this to him. He says, not only, I'm not only going to strike you down, I'm going to cut your head off. Okay, we're getting a little violent here, David. You're a young man, getting a little violent. So he goes from there, and then he says this, and I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and, the, and all the earth will know that there is a God in Israel. I mean, you hear what he's getting after? He's saying, I'm not just going after you, Goliath. You're just part of the problem. I'm going after the root of it all. I'm going to kill all of you guys. This is David. This is David. A little bitty guy going after a massive giant and also speaking to the rest of them saying, he's first and you're next. You know what I'm saying? He's first and you're next. It's, it's like you don't, you don't do that kind of stuff. And I'm going to get to that point in a second. But some of us have gotten so far in our faith as a Christian that we have become a completely incapable or unable because we don't even believe it anymore. I'm not saying you don't believe about Jesus. I'm not saying you don't believe about God. I'm not saying you don't believe the Bible. What I'm saying is you don't really believe the things about God and how he declares himself to be the God who works the impossible. He's the God who helps those whose heart is directed towards him. And he don't care how tall you are or how smart you are. He's looking for those whose heart is directed towards him. It says the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the earth to look for those who are wholeheartedly given to himself. It does not matter where you come from or where you think you're going. When you give yourself to the Lord, he's got bigger and better and better plans than you could have ever imagined. Amen? Shoot. I'm telling you. The first audience, they were asleep. They must have stayed up late. So anyway, he tells him this in verse 47. And he says, and, and that all the assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword or with a spear. Now listen to this. I want you to mark it in your Bible. For the battle is the Lord's. And he will give you into my hands. And the rest, as you can say, is history. Now there's some cool points in the rest of this. I'm going to get to it in just a little bit later. But he goes up to him. And when it says that Goliath moves forward to him. You know how a lot of people, when you get scared, you go, you cower back or you turn tail and run. It says that as soon as Goliath took that first step forward is when David, he took off after him. Took off straight ahead. I don't know exactly what it looked like, but spinning his deal, whatever that went with, and just boom, popped him right there in the head, knocked him flat out. Can you imagine his, his armor bears just like, 
Like, y'all watch that Ronda Rousey fight? She got straight up knocked out. I didn't watch the fight. I didn't watch the fight, but you can watch the highlight. 48 seconds, everybody's like, I mean, poor girl, I feel bad. Anyway. It's the same probably thing right there where the, all the army is just like, oh, no. Do you ever see something that happens and you're like, is that a dream? Like, did, this, did, did that really just happen? Is this happening right now? Is this, is this taking place? Because it really changes all the projection of your plans and all of your future ideas of what you were about to do and what was about to happen. He comes down and it says that David runs up, grabs Goliath's sword because he don't even have one, pulls that sucker out and chops off that dude's head. And he ends up taking the Goliath's head back to the tent where Saul's at. And Saul's over here saying like, whose son is that? Like, who? Who is, who is, David had been in his court, remember chapter 16, because Saul had a, a, a spirit upon him that the Lord had sent to cause him to be very depressed and angry and so on and so forth. And so David had come in, like he knew who David was, but he had to do a double take. Listen, some of y'all are out here today, some of y'all are out here today, when you tell people what the Lord has done in your life, they have to do a double take. And they say, who? You're doing what? You mean you're not going out drinking? You're not going out to the club? You're not going out chasing women or doing whatever? Like you're not going to spend your night doing that? You're, 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 you're going to go home and go to bed and you're going to go to church? Like you're going to go to church in the, in the morning when you should be sleeping, when you could be doing anything else and putting up Christmas trees and all the rest? Like you're going to, I'm telling you, there's a lot of people out here, if you knew their stories and they know their stories, you know that you wouldn't have been here two years ago or maybe even two months ago and God's done a powerful work in your life and you're totally different and people have to do a double take. As to whether they turn their head or not, I don't know, but they simply say, I, I don't believe it. When I tell people that God has called me into ministry, they say, say, say again, <laughs> you, you know, the, the people in Stonewall, Gloucester area must have gotten desperate to call up you. I mean, let, let you in the church, must let on the, on the stage or a pulpit, however you want to call that. I mean, like God's used you, and the, and the answer is like, yeah. Like, I, I don't know why. I have, no, I have nothing, nothing there, but I mean, God, God uses people, and that's the thing. It's not about what you're capable of doing. It's all about how capable our God is because he can use you, in you and through you. It's, it's not about you. You're right. You're not nearly as great as you think you are, and the greater you think you are, honestly, it's the farther you are from reality, to be very honest. It's what God can do in you and God can do through you that is the power at work within you. See, everybody had belittled David, like he isn't gonna make it, he's not gonna do it, because all they saw was his physical and they didn't understand that the Lord God had anointed him. He had the spirit of God upon him. And it makes all the difference of the world when you know that God is for you. He's not against you, that he gave the greatest gift. Therefore, he'll give you whatever else you need in this lifetime. Does it always look the way you want? No. Does it always appear the way you want? How many of y'all want some giants in your life in 2017? And everybody said, no way. <laughs> you know, I mean, like, to be honest, like, everybody's like, we all want to be David's. Yeah, right, until you get up there. You know, you're just like, I don't want to do this. Like, somebody needs to make a, a recall or, or I don't know what just happened. No, nobody wants to go through something that, honestly, if you want to compare him, it's catastrophe. I mean, any other circumstance, that is sure death. Let's, and you're like, well, that didn't really bother. Sure death to your finances. How many of y'all want to start over right now? You have nothing. How many, how many of y'all just want to start over right now? You're just like, I, I have not a cent to my name and I have debt. How many of y'all really just want to do that and you have that giant in your life to begin to fight? Now, none of us just say, yeah, I want to go to the front line for that one. I, that's, that's what I would like to do. You know, how, how many of you want to have your marriage hanging on just by this little, little bitty thread and there's no hope beyond the fact that you know you should just, just keep on keeping on? How many of y'all just really want that? Nobody wants that giant in their life. But sometimes it takes things just like that to realize how incapable you are and how capable God is. Sometimes it takes things that are just beyond our ability to comprehend, to understand, to reason, to simply say that, God, I never knew you like that, and I never knew you were there like that until I went through that. It's not that we want to go through bad things. I don't want to go through bad things, but I sure want to know one thing, that I mind is set upon the Lord and that the battle is his at the end and the start, actually the start and the end of the day. It's his. I'm going to be faithful with what he's called me to do. I'm going to do whatever I'm supposed to do as best I can and repent along the way. It says repent daily. Did you notice that in the Lord's example prayer? Forgive us of our sins. He's talking about a daily prayer. That means every day there's something probably going on in your world that you should be saying, God, I know that shouldn't have been in my mind or out of my lips or through my hands. Like, I need to continually draw near and get close to you. I better get going because the message is going to be taken along. Okay, number one is this. My past has prepared me for my future. 
My past has prepared me. That's one of the things you got to think about. David said, listen, I'm not coming up here as a rookie just because I'm young. He says, I've killed lions and I've killed bears when they came to attack the flock. I've done this. This is no, this is no different. He's just a Philistine. He's a pagan. He's defying the name of God. This is not my battle. This is the Lord's battle. This is for the Lord's name. This is for the Lord's sake. This is not me. You know, I mean, think about this. How many of y'all would love to take back some of the things in your past? Everybody said yes. We all would love to take back some of those things. But here's the answer. You can't take back those things. And what you have to do is say, God, I need forgiveness of those things. And God, I need to learn from those things, right? That's a big difference. Not just saying how sad I am about my past, but saying, God, you know what? I want to make a difference in my future. I want to make a change in the things that I'm doing now. I don't want to just live always regretting because of what I did yesterday. I can't change those things, but I can change what I do tomorrow i got to make a decision today, and I tell you what, honestly, it's a change of perspective. Not a change of your past, it's a change of perspective, saying, I've been forgiven, I've been redeemed, I've been saved. You know, it says those who what? Who owe much and have been forgiven, they love much. we got some people out here this morning who love Jesus a lot because we know what we've been forgiven of. We know the things that we've done and gone through. Even Thomas Edison said to a woman interviewing him, he says, what does it feel like to fail so many times? You know, what? what's it feel to fail so many times? He said, I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that don't work. You know, it, that, that's a great way. And what that is, is it's not a change of reality. It's a change of perspective. And you need to have your mind renewed to say, you know what, God? I cannot change those things, but I can learn from those things. And I can make other decisions because some of us, honestly, we have our 10,000 mistakes. You know, we have our 10,000, oh, did it again. I mean, honestly, even as a Christian, you got some of those where you just on a probably almost on a daily basis, you're like, good gum it. Why did I why did I do that? And why did I act out like that? And why did I say those things? And knowing you can't retract words even if you apologize for them. You know? I mean, why? But yet we're still living and we're saying, you know, we're not perfect, but the God we serve is. And we're not where we're going, but we're working our way in that direction because he who began a good work in you, he's gonna bring it to fruition. He's gonna finish it. You see, that, that takes pressure off me. A lot of people believe that it's all about it's up to you. I, I say it's not up to you. I say it's your responsibility as well. It's kind of to say which side of the blade of the scissors is going to cut the paper, right? Both blades are important. Well, it's kind of a neat little illustration to look at it. It's God who works in you and through you. It's God who, who gives you in the will and the desire to do it, but you still have to carry it out. Do you understand that? Like you're responsible, but I'm also understanding that God's going to make it happen. Even through my fumbles, even through my failures, that all things work together for the glory of God, for all those who love him and are called according to his, what, purpose. They work together for us who are called according to his purpose. So I have a few little small things I want you to take down. There was more to David than met the eye. There was more to David than met the eye. Samuel dismissed David even before he saw him because he saw his older brother Eliab in uh, chapter 16. The Lord said, go anoint one of the sons of Jesse. There's, there's going to be someone there. I want you to anoint them. And as soon as he sees Eli, he's big, he's tall, he's handsome. He's like, that's got to be it. How many times do we say that that's got to be the person? Whether they're smart, whether they're attractive, whether they're strong, whether they're fast, whatever it is, we're like, that's the guy or that's the girl. And God said, I don't look at people like you look at people. D doesn't that help you out just a little bit this morning? I mean, some of y'all might be some very capable people and God has blessed you in those areas. But I'm just saying, think about this. God says, I do not care about all the stuff that all of y'all care about. We're all in this rat race trying to impress people who don't really care about us. You know what I mean? We're always trying to have more of this and more of that. And, more, and God's like, I don't care. I don't. Not impressive. I own it all anyway. You ever thought of that? God owns everything you got. You too. He owns it all. And so God's over here saying, he says, I don't look. I look at the heart. Because God can do anything he wants to do. Remember John the Baptist when he's talking to those Pharisees? He says, listen, don't think that just because you're ethnic descendants of Israel that God can't raise up Israelites out of these stones. Okay, God can do whatever he pleases. He created it all. He spoke it into existence. We need to realize it is not our ability, and we do not need to dismiss God's ability. It's all about what can God do through you and in you. Too much of us, we're saying, well, what can I do? And what we should be saying, God, what would you like to do? That's pretty good. Well, a lot of us are saying, what can I do? And honestly, we should begin to say, God, what would you like to do? 
What, what would you like to do? What are your ambitions for me? What are your visions for me? What would you like? And this is why I'm saying prayer and fasting is so important because honestly, when you begin to forego some of those meals and rather than spending the time prepping and all that other stuff, you just say, God, I'm, I'm looking for you and God, I don't want to do all the other stuff that I normally do. I want to put away some of these things and these distractions. God, I want, I want you. You know what that, I mean, that's honestly what you're really getting at with fasting. You're saying, God, I want you. Because yes, you need food, but what did Jesus say? We're to live what? Not by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Listen, we need a word from God this year, don't we? Every single one of us, we need a word from God. We need God to speak into our lives. We need to start our trajectory off right by going into his presence saying, God, I'm here, I'm listening. What do you have to say to your servant? Secondly is this, that he was faithful in the mundane. Too many of us find ourselves complaining continually about where we're at rather than beginning to say, God, I want to thank you for now, but I do would like, I'd like to go in this direction. How can I prepare for that? How can I get my mind set on those things? How can I be Begin to see where you have me going. Luke 16 10 says this One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. Can God trust you where you're at? Can God trust you in the job that honestly you don't like? Can God trust you maybe in the marriage that you're just saying it's not exactly where I'd like to be and it's not exactly what I want it to be or the relationship, whatever it is? Can God trust you where you're at? At so that he can continue to elevate you to different levels so that you can continue to shine forth his glory through you. We got to be faithful in the small things because this is what he goes on to say. And the one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. Now, this is contextually speaking about money. It's so how, how do we use our money and so forth? But it's also principally speaking about how do we live our lives? Can we be trusted with what God has already given you and thankful so that we'll be prepared to receive and to go after that which is ahead of us. Can we be prepared and can we be thankful? It says in Zechariah 4.10, this is New Living Translation, it says, do not despise these small beginnings for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. Don't despise the small beginnings. Remember, David was not there as a warrior. David was there as an errand boy. Don't ever forget that it doesn't matter where you're at in life, God can use you and God can delightfully surprise you as well. But a lot of times those things that look to be obstacles are honestly opportunities. It's just all about how are you going to pursue them? How are you going to walk forward in those? And lastly here is he had childlike faith in God. I I didn't want to use that word. I just knew it sounded more spiritual to everyone else, childlike faith. I almost wanted to say the word naive, even though that sounds bad. David was just like, He's defying God. I know what we need to do. Let's kill him. (laughs) You know, I mean, and you're over here like, I'm supposed to kill people? No, you're not supposed to kill people. Okay, y'all are on the same page with me. No. But what he's getting after is this. He's like, he's not a problem. Like, why why do all y'all see such a big problem? Why why is he such an obstacle to you? Because here's here's the thing. If you spend more time focusing on your problem than with God, your problem will be bigger than God. I'm serious. I mean, that's common sense. There's no rocket science here. I mean, if you spend more time worrying about things, it's honestly worrying, what's that going to get you? Nowhere. It's just like a rocking chair. It just goes back and forth. All you're doing is just wasting your time. And, and you're worrying about things that are the what ifs and could have beens because you don't even really know until you get there. Rather than being on your knees, you're just wasting the time being anxious about everything. And Jesus says, listen, there's enough worry for today that you don't have to always worry about tomorrow because you need to deal with today. Too many of us are worried about 180 days ahead, six months ahead, or 12 months ahead, rather than saying, God, I need to deal with my stuff today. You know, I need to deal with my stuff today. God has called us to a childlike faith. He even says in Scripture, he says, unless you come to the kingdom as a child, that doesn't mean ignorant, but just simply with the faith that says, God, I believe you. I believe all of us start out at some level with that type of faith, but honestly, over time, we talk ourselves out of it. It's like we believe the Bible, but we were kind of like, you know, but I really don't believe he can, you know, miraculously heal people. So I'll be really careful how I pray. I don't want to sound stupid, you know, because we don't want to be let down or we don't want to sound stupid. Honestly, God's over here like, I'd much rather you sound stupid and believe me. I'd much rather you pray and and pray powerfully and pray boldly. And honestly, if, if I'm saying no, then you just be okay with that. But I'd much rather you believe me and trust me and and believe the words of Scripture that says that everything is possible with God. There's nothing that's impossible with God. There's no marriage that can't be healed and there's no finances that can't be restored. You know what I'm saying? There's, There's none of those things. 
Too much of our thought goes on what the enemy tells us rather than what God has declared in his word. The second is this, the battle to come or the battles to come are the Lord's. The battles to come are the Lord's. And I know some of y'all already have areas in your life that you're going to be dealing with in 2017. You already know what they are. Some of you don't know what they are. Some of you are on errand, if you will. You're, you're going, you're doing, you're actively engaging in life, and you don't know what's ahead of you, but you honestly realize that every day there's an opportunity, and every day there's also a chance for an obstacle as well, that there is something that's ahead of you in this life. And some of us, we got to begin to realize that we need fresh perspective on the way that we see things, the way that we deal with things. Because honestly, we need to get this idea. It's not how capable you are. It's how capable God is. It's not knowing what you're facing. It's knowing who you're facing it with. It tells us in Matthew 28, verse 20, it says Jesus told the disciples before he was to leave, he says, and behold. He's like, you just be in awe of this statement for just a second. Just look, I am with you always to the end of the age. Maybe someone needs to just hear that this morning. Like, God's with you. God's with you. God, God is not going away from you. Remember Jonah? When Jonah tried to run from God? What a novel idea, right? It's a good one, huh? Run from God. Creator of all things. Everywhere. Omnipresent, right? Run from God. Good idea. He tries to run from God, and God does what? He loves him enough to discipline him. He straight up sends like a hurricane <laughs> on the water. You know, I don't think it's a great idea to run from God or run from what God's calling you to do because he loves you enough to bring you back and to humble you and to get you where you need to be. But the thing is this, that God is with you. And for his children, he don't let you go. It says a mother might forget her children, but it says the father, he won't forget his. It says he inscribes us on the palm of his hand. He knows every single one of us. He loves every single one of us, knows what every single one of us needs. But we need to understand the tactics of the enemy. The first is this, fear. Why fear? Fear paralyzes. Fear causes you to do what? Exactly what the Israelites did and exactly what Saul did. It says that they saw him and that they heard him and that they were what? Dismayed by him. They were blown away. We cannot defeat this guy. We have got to just stay on our side and hope for the best. David saw something different. He believed the Lord. It says this in Isaiah 41, verse 10, fear not. You know, the Bible says that in some form or another well over 100 times. Why do you think the Bible says it so many times? Because we have such a natural tendency to do what? Fear things. We have such a natural tendency to, to fear good things, to be honest with you. We don't fear bad things nearly enough or the consequences of them. We fear good things a lot of times. We fear good relationships, godly relationships, because they begin to have to open us up to be able to enjoy them or to have them. You know, we, we fear stepping out on something that we know through prayer, we know through God's word, we know through other Christians speaking into our lives that we need to go there, but honestly, it's not comfortable, and so we fear the unknown. And what is God telling you to do? He says, the Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not fear. The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not fear. I shall not want. He says, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, and I will help you, and I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. First is fear. Second is deception. One of the most wicked and evil people of the last generation, Adolf Hitler, said this. If you tell a big enough lie and tell it frequently enough, it will be believed. If you tell a big enough lie, and if you tell it enough times, it'll be believed. How many of y'all have read the promises of God, but yet have believed a lie long enough because you keep on hearing it in your ear, whispered in your ear, other people telling you, you can't do it. That will never happen. That'll never work. You shouldn't die it that way. You know, you shouldn't do it. Listen, you should listen to other people, but you should be very careful who you got in your corner. Be very careful as to who is speaking into your life. Be very careful as to the influences that you allow because, listen, your friends do influence it, you. The things that you allow in your life, they do influence you. And you should be very, very, very vigilant as to what allows your heart to flow out. And third is discouragement. Discouragement. Some of us get pushed away from God thinking that God is the one shaming us. It's never God who shames us. It's Satan who always what condemns us. If you ever feel an urge in your heart to draw you away from church or draw you away from fellowship and, and, and community together with other people or, or feel God pulling you in a direction that says, you know, you're not worth it. You can never be forgiven. You should never show back up at church. They're only going to judge you. They don't really care about you. If you ever hear those words in your heart, in your ears, 
I'll go and tell you straight up, that is the devil speaking lies because that's all he knows how to speak. That is satanic. That is demonic. I don't care what you call it. That is completely false. It's against God. God will always bring you back. God will always nurture you. God will always also convict you, but in such a way that would cause you to be healed and to love him even more because you understand what he has done for you. Praise the Lord. It's totally different what God does for his people and for his children. And lastly, as we get ready to close, is I will run towards the challenge ahead, not away. I will run towards the challenge ahead, not away. Why do we compete in contests? Why do we have sporting games? Because what? We want to see who the victor is. Why do you take tests? You take tests to see if you've learned, if you're able to uh, conquer whatever is ahead of you. What are you doing? When God gives you an opportunity that seems so difficult, what's God doing in the midst of all that? He, one, he's teaching you to depend upon him, have faith in him. But also, here's another thing. God's showing out. God's showing out. And some of y'all are like, I don't know if that's the way God shows out or not. Listen, you can have God showing out in you even in the midst of defeat if you handle it right. I'll say that one more time because we all want to talk about victory. Sooner or later, there's going to be areas in your life that just don't go the way that you think they should or the way that you want them to go. You can still honor God in defeat. You can still honor God in failure. You can still have a heart of integrity and carry yourself in a fashion that doesn't respond to other people the way they've responded to you and the way that they've treated you. You can still hold your head high. You can still live a Christian life in spite of those around you who are calling you by names otherwise. You can still do it. God has an opportunity to show off within us by giving us an opportunity to face things that grow our faith. If God left you alone, which is what most of us want, you would never grow. And to be very honest with you, you would never depend upon him because you'd be satisfied with where you're at. God's saying this is not all that there is to it. There's more to it than this. More to it than the 70 years. More to it than the house and the cars and whatever else it is that maybe your ambitions are driving you to. Those things aren't bad, but honestly, if that's your it, then you've missed it. God is the it. God is the pleasure. God is the desire. He's everything that is fulfilling in our lives when we are drawn to him in a full knowledge of of him and a full knowledge of him and i'll end with this thought the victory that you that you have ahead of you very possibly it's not just for you see we're a lot of times we're all about like what can i get out of this situation or maybe i'm just a really narcissistic person and that's probably true i'm I'm looking at like what can happen and what can be good out of this and and i want to say this to you that There can be a lot of great things that happen, but the victory is not all about you. What happened when David slung that stone? The trajectory of Israel changed at that very moment as soon as that stone struck him in the head. Play it slow motion with me. Stone strikes him in the head, sinks into his forehead. Giant, I don't know how slow, but let's go slow motion. Falls backwards or whatever, maybe face first. David runs up, he grabs that sword, chops off that guy's head, and the entire other army the enemy of your soul, the ones who said you're gonna be defeated, the ones who said that you're nothing, the ones who said that you can amount to nothing, every single one of them, it said, turn tail, and they ran. And the deflated Israelites all of a sudden rose up with a shout, and they chased after him. I wanna say this, that your victories are not just for you alone, it's for your prosperity, those who are coming after you, for your kids. Some of y'all got some things in your life that need to be broken. Some of y'all have some habits in your life that need to be broken. Some things that have been generationally handed down, if you will, that need to be broken in the name of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus. There's some of us that need to realize that even in our victories, that we're carrying others with us. They see us and they see what's going on in your life. And you need to carry the torch ahead of them. That God's called you to do that. God's called you to leave a legacy. That one moment in David's life changed everything, not only for Israel, but also for him. He rolls them in town the next time. That is some shepherd boy that nobody knows. He rolls up in town next time and they're singing, Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. You never know where your moment's at, but we got to be faithful with where you're at now before you're ever going to get there. 2017 can be a great year no matter what you go through because of the God we serve. 2017, I'll say it again, can be a great year no matter what you go through because of whom you're with, the God you serve. Jesus Christ that's where I end this and I hope this begins to launch us as we get ready for a new year I honestly ask you and almost urge a little bit that you would consider the prayer and fasting 
three days of corporate fast is what we're doing. And keep on going if you want to. Or, or inside of that booklet on the, on the desk over there is, is a Daniel fast too if you want to use certain foods or whatever. I'm, I'm just saying whatever you, whatever you wholeheartedly feel to do to the Lord, keep your word. You know, whatever that is. Maybe it's a day, maybe it's three days, I don't know. But seek him, that's the whole point. It's not can you be strong enough to go three days or whatever. It's seek him. Seek his face. Love the Lord thy God. With all your heart, your soul, strength, your mind, every, every bit of you. Give God your best. Start your year off right. Let's stand. Let's pray as we get ready to sing this song. Father, we love you.